Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I was genuinely delighted to receive it. I personally, honestly believe that Indian students are the best in the world. <laughs> I, I've, I've lived for many years in, in, in different parts of the world, and in England in particular, and the Indian students were always among the best achieving. And. Uh, and that's why I brought my son here, to see that you can be cool, yet you can still be hardworking, serious, and meticulous. <laughs> but with regards to inhibition, Daddy, forget about that. Breaking out of it, we can talk at home about it. Anyway, it, it's, so, so my mission is so difficult. I'm going to, following this fantastic lineup of speakers, I will be trying to make boring science a bit exciting in a TEDx meeting. I've done that in lecture theaters in universities for many years, but in a TEDx meeting, I'll do my best. So at Qatar Genome Project, our main mission is basically to pave the way towards precision medicine. Paving the way by building the infrastructure and collecting a huge amount of data about the genetics of the Qatari population. But towards precision medicine, what is precision medicine all about? And by the way, this is, this is, this is, it keeps changing. It used to be called individualized medicine, then personalized medicine, and now precision medicine. But they all mean the same thing. And to make that clear, we just have to see how classical medical practice have been going for the last centuries, basically. Basically, it was all a one-size-fits-all approach. So to prevent disease, there's one measure, there's one way to do it for everyone. To treat disease, again, it's a one-size-fits-all. To diagnose disease, all the medical practices were the best fits for all of us. And you can see it doesn't work all the time. My favorite is the fourth guy from the left. So when, it, when it's a treatment of a serious disease, that could mean he's not getting the optimal care. And to change that, and, and, and after all these centuries or even thousands of years, now we are going to tailor your medical care around your genome. And we're realizing more and more that, okay, we are 99.9 .9 identical in our genomes, but this 0.1% is so important when it comes to disease susceptibility. So what we are doing now is we're trying to characterize this 0.1% differences that makes us susceptible to disease and then try to design the whole of your healthcare around those differences and then give you a more efficient, a more suitable sort of treatment with regards to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So I call it the evolution of NGS technology. That's the key to the, to the revolution in genomics and in medical care in general. What is NGS? NGS is next generation sequencing. It's basically the development of the sequence, the technology that enabled us to sequence the whole of the human genome in practically short, very short time and at very low cost. And to tell you how much, why is that a revolution and why this evolution is, is, is one of the most dramatic over, yani, over, over centuries of, 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 of developments in healthcare. These are just examples. In just over a decade, 10, 15 years, to sequence one genome, it, it, it took thousands of these machines, at least hundreds of them. Sequencers that will fill, I, th I, I, would, I would comfortably say, five or 10 auditoriums like that size. Each one of them is that big. To sequence one genome, you, you would need hundreds or thousands of these machines. Nowadays, you can do it with this small thingy. You can get the whole genome. And it's so exciting. Can you see that USB link? So basically, what you can do now is that you can plug that into your laptop, and there's a flow cell over there where you can just put a drop of blood, not even pure DNA, you can just put blood. The extraction will happen, and then the sequencing will be appearing on your screen, on your laptop screen, real time. 
This is science fiction, even to us in the field. It's evolving at, 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 this, at a pace that no one is actually try, uh, able to keep pace of. Companies went up, made billions, and then went down because other competitors came up with absolutely new technology. It's not like mobile phones where you get more pixels in the camera or higher speed with the internet browsing. It's completely different technologies, one after the other, separated by only a year or two. And now Oxford Nanopore are coming with this mini ion. It's just a handheld device. So practically, what I used to say to my students 10, 15 years ago without knowing how that will happen, but I've just had a feeling it will, it is now happening. I used to tell them that having your genome sequence will be as easy as taking your, sugar, your blood uh, sugar, and it is happening. The first human genome did actually cost $3 billion. Now you can do it for under $1,000. It is happening, and now... People are saying that it will stabilize at $1,000, but we've just heard in the news a couple of months ago, there's a new machine where you can do it in a few hours for a fraction of this price, so around a couple of hundred of dollars. 10, 15 years ago, the first genome took Bill Clinton and Tony Blair to go in a press conference live on both sides of the Atlantic announcing the sequencing of the first human genome. Now sequencing a genome is, by the way, I think this is the old version of the, of the talk, but never mind. So nowadays, sequencing it, you get excited in the lab, but then it doesn't impress anyone anymore. In the pilot phase of the Qatar, pilot phase of the Qatar Genome Project, we've sequenced 3,000 genomes. And then we thought, that's not enough for the pilot phase, so we've sequenced another 3,000. We've sequenced 6,000 genomes in the pilot phase. Again, when Clinton and Blair and actually Jack Chirac went in another press conference in Paris, I think, the Japanese did something else because those are the main four countries who took part in the sequencing of the first human genome. It was just one genome. And now in the pilot phase, we've sequenced 6,000 genomes. So, because of the development of the technology, it was finally possible for countries to sequence whole populations and to get really into the age of precision medicine or individualized medicine. And Qatar was, with the vision of, with the vision of Her Highness Sheikha Moza, took the lead, not only regionally. We're being humble when it says Qatar is a regional leader. Actually, it's a world leader. We're among the the first league, if you, the premier league, if you wish, of, of, of countries taking such initiatives at a larger scale. Obama declared the Precision Medicine Initiatives initiative a year after we started. China is, is just about to start. The first was Iceland. Why Iceland? Because that little island in the north of the Atlantic Ocean was the first one to actually venture into that field because it's a small country with only 300,000 in a, a, a small population of 300,000 citizens, similar to the Qatari population, and they're homogeneous, so it was a heaven for geneticists to study, and it's, the, the population is manageable. And why Qatar is now potentially another Iceland, or even a better Iceland, and it's not just us who are saying that, everybody around the world are waiting for the outcome of the Qatar Genome Project, again because, it's a country with huge resources, state-of-the-art genomic infrastructure, talented scientists from all over the world, and a manageable sort of healthcare system. You have one healthcare provider, which is HMC, Hamad Medical Corporation, so you can design your policies and actually implement them, and you have a small population, and it's a homogeneous population, so it's, it's again, it's a gold mine for genetic discovery. So it's a small population, yet it represents a larger region. So the Qatari population at least represents the tens of millions of other Middle Easterns working, living in this, in, in this part of the world. And if you want to complete the whole human race genome map, you have to fill the gaps. So far, the, 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 the information is coming from Western Europe, North America, and the Far East. But no one is bringing 
to the world a lot of the genomic information about the human race from Africa, Asia, and other parts of the world. And Qatar is filling that gap for the Middle East. It's an applicable comprehensive land because, again, we have small country with huge resources and centralized sort of healthcare. Genomics bioinformatics infrastructure is state of the art in Qatar. And when I was first, when I first joined the, 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 this, this program, I mean, we, we've, talk, we've talking about sequencers, yeah? The, the top of the range now is something called the HiSeq X10. That's an Illumina machine, okay? So when they called me, they, they told me they got the, the job. I would th the first thing I thought, would they have one of these? That would be great. If they don't have, I have to convince them to buy it. It's a bit expensive, but it will be so useful. And when I arrived, I discovered Qatar has 10 of these. So it's one of the best bioinformatics genomics infrastructures around. And the, the amount of talent working on this infrastructure and this project is absolutely beautiful. And the last advantage we have is having the Qatar Biobank. So we're not just sequencing genomes. Every single Qatari citizen who is sequenced will also receive three hours of a complete medical check where we get 70 different blood markers. We get, of course, height, weight, medical history, uh, ECG, retinal images, carotid images. We even get bone density, so complete medical checkup. And then you get his whole genome. So the synergy created from combining these two huge data sets is absolutely marvelous. So once we sequence enough of the Qatari population, it will be one of the most characterized, medically characterized population on the planet. And that would make healthcare policy planners in, in an absolutely wonderful position to plan for future based on the, the deep knowledge they know about the health of the population. So, so we are here. We're a small team, actually. But thanks to the vision of those who started this project is that they did not want to duplicate resources. So we're a small group managing all these resources. So we have a big family. We're a small family, but we have a lot of cousins. So we have, we have, at SIDRA, we have the sequencing and the bioinformatics being performed at SIDRA. We have wonderful uh, state-of-the-art sequencing lab and, and very talented bioinformaticians. Uh, QBB, we get a lot of support. Those directly involved with us are around 22. We have academic partners in HBKU and at Qatar University. We have over 100 researchers. Basically, we involve every single geneticist in Qatar, whether he is in Sidra, Qatar University, QBRI, or other places, Cornell. We are involving him because the amount of data we're producing is enormous, and we need the help from everyone. So what we've achieved in this pilot phase, we've got 7,000 samples from Qatar Biobank. We've sequenced 6,200 of them. We've conducted public surveys to know where we stand. To, and, and, and one of the, we've done these huge surveys for the whole population and for healthcare practitioners in hospitals, nurses and doctors, how prepared they are to deliver such service in the future. And one of the, out of the hundreds of figures we got, I was looking for one figure, which is when we, at the end of all this big questionnaire, we ask the citizens, would you be willing to take part in the Qatar Genome Project and donate blood? And that answer would decide what happens after the pilot phase. We can't impose that on, on people. And I was always anxious to get that number. I forgot about all the, hundred of, uh, the other hundreds of, of numbers. I was worried about that. I was always envious of the numbers they got in England and in, in Iceland, where 70 plus percent of the population said yes. And I, I, I was always saying that that's a population of geneticists, how, how enthusiastic they can be. And we got that. I was jumping in my office when we got 71, 72% of the Qatari population saying, yes, I'm strongly, willingly, happy to participate in the Qatar Genome Project, meaning that we can now plan large scale out of the pilot phase. QGB Research Consortium, the amount of data is huge. Let me just tell you one example. One genome can saturate, I don't know how many dozens of laptops. 
So it's a huge amount of data, and we need an, a small army of, of researchers working on that. We've initiated two graduate programs to prepare the, the new generations to deliver such services and in hospitals. We are working with the Ministry of Public Health and other authorities on policies and regulations that will govern all that. We, we're, conduct, we're, we're holding conferences and workshops and summer internships, and we we're designing something that I will talk about in a bit, in a bit called the Qatar Genome, Gene Chip. So this is the picture of the consortium. Our researchers represent all the institutes in Qatar, SIDRA, HMC, Wild Cornell, QBRI, QCRI, and Qatar universities, and they have partners from all around the world, from Stanford, NIH, Sanger in Cambridge, uh, Pasteur in France, Tübingen in Germany, uh, Triste in Italy, and Spain, and guess what? We have also uh, research collaborations in India for those wonderful scientists. We are initiating two graduate programs, one in precision medicine, genomic and precision medicine at HBKU, and another in genetic counseling at Qatar University. We hold summer internships. This is the uh, third summer internship last August to prepare people or lure them into the field and become the new genetic counselors or the new geneticists in labs. We are working with different authorities to prepare the regulations and policies that will govern such new practices. And we are soon going to be delivering lifestyle reports to, to, to get something back to those enthusiastic participants coming to Qatar Biobank and donating samples. So we will give them some information uh, that will help them uh, for example, in, in, the, in their lifestyle, will tell them what food suits you more and, and, and what sorts of uh, diet he can go on and what sort of exercise suits him best. And then we will move into pharmacogenomics, which is telling him exactly what drug suits you better than others. And then we will go to disease-based reports in the end, and we will talk about disease risks. And we kept that till the end because this is, this, you need the whole loop completed to start giving, telling people that you are at risk of uh, a serious disease in I don't know how many years. So you can't just tell him that and say bye. You have to prepare the genetic counselors and you have to refer him to a specialist uh, clinic in HMC or in Sidra and other places. So un until we complete that, we're starting with general lifestyle and wellness reports. This is one of the, we call it the quick wins or low-hanging fruits. When we finish studying the thousands of genomes we, we are analyzing now, we can put all the Qatari-relevant mutations on a small chip. Because most of the diagnostic assays have been developed in North America or Western Europe. They are looking for mutations prevalent in those populations. So when you use them to diagnose disease here, you will get false negatives because they're not looking for mutations that are relevant here. So what we'll do now is that we will design this chip and then put it back uh, to, to, to HMC, for example, and tell them we've included 40,000 mutations for 3,000 diseases. You can use that as HMC for neonatal screening or for premarital testing. Instead of doing it for three disease disorders now, you can do it for thousands of diseases. So we've finished the pilot phase. We're now in the biobank phase where we will go with the biobank till the mark of around 10% of the population. And then that in itself is a huge sort of accomplishment. 10% is representative of the population. But we will go ahead and do the whole population, hopefully. Thank you very much.